Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Online Church. Also, welcome to the hallway in the office building, or as I like to call it, the only place that yard work is not happening on campus right now. If you are new or not, let me invite you to head over to northbrookumc.com slash online dash worship, where you can let us know that you are with us. Also on that same page, you can find our online giving link, and you can join our email list to receive more information about what is going on around here. If you missed the last couple of weeks and you have not yet sent in your pledge, let me encourage you to go to northbrookumc.com give to find out more. Our stewardship initiative this year is called One Body, One Spirit, One Church. Take note that this afternoon at 4 p.m. we will have a Zoom charge conference for the purpose of approving a new amendment for the contract on the former Christ UMC campus. Our kids are live on Sunday mornings now at 9.30, ages 4 to 5th grade, are welcome to meet Sarah Roberts online every Sunday. If you need to figure out how just to do that, email Sarah at sroberts at northbrookumc.com. She would be happy to guide you and help you into getting into all that fun on Sunday mornings. Also join Leslie Bowers this Tuesday as she continues to lead a Zoom on the different spiritual practices. Register online that, for that at the link below. Now. This week is the final week of our January Missions Project for North Fulton Community Charities. We are collecting things like bar soap, toothpaste, paper products, shampoo, uh, things like that. Leave those items at the donation center right behind me in the portico. We are currently collecting notes and anything on our wish list in support of North Fulton Hospital. They are working so hard, our healthcare workers, so please join our efforts to lift them up. Now. These dates are really important. The ones on screen, they are our 2021 Habitat for Humanity build dates. So sign up. All the information is right on your screen right now. Lastly, Northbrook is hosting Family Promise at Roswell Prez from February 21st to 27th. We need some overnight hosts and some supplies. So contact Dave for ways to help with that. I know we need all the help we can get. And I also know that all of this may seem like quite a lot. It is, but man, I love this church and your willingness to help in so many ways. Thank you for all that you do to help the community, to help others, to help those that you don't even know. You are the hands and feet of Christ and you are at work in this community. God is using us and I thank you. The church, this church is one of the most generous places I've ever known. So thank you for giving your time, your resources, your prayers, and your service to continue the mission of Northbrook in this community. If you would like to give financially to Northbrook, you can find a few of those ways on your screen. Again, I thank you for the offering that you give, and I pray that in the giving, you might find God in a new and exciting way. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, we give you thanks for your presence with us. May our gifts today help your kingdom find its way more deeply into our world and into our hearts. Amen.
Let one train on this track runs to heaven and right back. St. Peter walking at the gate said, Come on, sinner, don't be late. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I pray. Every time Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I pray. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I pray. I will pray. I will pray. Good morning, Northbrook. My name is Ryan Young, and I'm one of the pastors here, and it is good to have you with us in worship this morning. As we prepare our hearts to go to God in prayer, I invite you to take a look at the list of names on your screen. These are people for whom prayer has been requested by our church family. I ask that you keep these names in your heart as we pray this morning. Uh, these names are also in the midweek updates so that you can have these people in front of you as you pray throughout the week. If you know any of these people, I encourage you to send them a text or to call them and let them know that you're thinking about them and that you've prayed for them this morning. Let them know that they are loved and they are missed. Now, will you please pray with me? God of light and love, God who calls us in and sends us forth, we worship you today in recognition of your calling of your invitation to us to share in the creative and healing work of your kingdom. We have heard you speak in us and through others. Help us, Lord, to respond to you and to follow down whichever path you are calling us. Awaken us, Lord, to hear what you would say to us. Open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to your presence. Grant us the discernment to know when it is your voice we are hearing and when it is our own prejudices and desires to which we are paying heed. Lord, we pray that we as your church might rise up with renewed commitment in answer to your call, that we, your people, may be instruments of your grace and love to our world. We confess that often we consider ourselves inadequate and dismiss or avoid your calling in our lives. And in these moments when we are honest, we are grateful that you continue inviting us, saying, come and see. And so we pray that you would forgive us for our lack of trust in you. Grant us the faith to believe in your calling and the courage to follow wherever you may lead. We pray for all of those who, in answering your call, might have to leave the known for the unknown, might have to leave the comfortable for discomfort, might have to set aside things uh, for which they have hoped and dreamed and worked in order to better love and serve others. Grant them courage and steadfast faith to heed your call and to trust in you. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, who himself taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture today comes from John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. The next day, John was standing again with two of his disciples. When he said, saw Jesus walking along, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he asked, What are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? He replied, come and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. One of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus was Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter. Good name. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. He led him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus wanted to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. Nathanael responded, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, He is a genuine Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these, I assure you that you will see heaven open and God's angels going up to heaven and down to earth on the human one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, since I last spoke to you, a lot has happened. I was told by the cabinet that I was needed at another church, so I will be moving soon. I'm also looking for a new place to live, and I'm working on planning a wedding, and oh yeah, <laughs> I'm getting married. I recently became an engaged person with a beautiful girl named Adair who I met the week before we paused in-person worship in March for the first time. Now, for Christmas, I gave Adair, in addition to a ring, one of my favorite books entitled The Historian. I read it maybe five years ago and had largely forgotten most of it. It is Elizabeth Kostova's first novel, and it is awesome. So, Adair and I entered into a little reading competition. Whoever finished the book first would receive a dinner of their choice, paid for by the other. Now I know what you're thinking, who won? Adair won. <laughs> but only because it's really difficult for me to read and play my PlayStation 5 at the same time. Who knew, right? Now, for those of you who are curious, the historian is essentially a story about a female Indiana Jones character, but instead of searching for the Ark of the Covenant, She's searching for Dracula, and man, it is a wild ride. 
And it all follows the one question. Is the same Dracula of history, a real guy named Vlad III, still alive? AKA, are vampires real? Now, I don't know how much you know about the real Dracula, but honestly, it's not like there's that much history about it. While he was a real person, Vlad III doesn't share anywhere near the same recognition as other figures throughout history. Queen Victoria, George Washington, Caesar, Cleopatra, Da Vinci. So, Elizabeth Kostova joins the ranks of Bram Stoker and all the movie directors and writers who take the obscure and short history of this real person and turn it into something universal and sinister and well-known by almost everyone. It's really a masterpiece in making something out of nothing. But making something out of nothing is one of my favorite things. I find the smallest details sometimes to be the most exciting and revealing. After all, isn't the almost nothing details of a thriller or a mystery, aren't, aren't those the things that change everything? Making something out of nothing, that's the story of every underdog movie and book, Rocky, Braveheart, Gladiator, even GameStop, if anybody is following the stock market this week, turning a $30 share into a $400 share. Now that's making something out of nothing. And it's also often my favorite part of reading the Gospels looking at individual words in the passages to see why the author wrote it down this way instead of that way. Sometimes it turns out to be nothing, but sometimes it's something. Take the scripture that we just read this morning. It's the end of a long first chapter filled with stories and details many of us may know better than the other passages in scripture. In the beginning was the Word, the introduction of John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus, and our passage for today is the author's version of the calling of the disciples. And it goes more or less like this. Andrew and John follow Jesus. Andrew gets Simon Peter and then he follows Jesus. Then Jesus calls Philip and Philip goes and gets Nathanael, tells him that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Nathanael chimes in, can anything good come from Nazareth? But Jesus talks to Nathanael about a fig tree and voila, Nathanael becomes uh, convinced and follows Jesus too. The end. Pretty straightforward. I mean, every gospel has its own take on it, but pretty run-of-the-mill calling of the disciples. Nothing happens that we do not expect. Except I do have one question, and I could be making something out of nothing, but my question is this. Who in the world is Nathaniel? <laughs> I know it's a minor detail, but seriously, who is this guy? Because I don't really remember him at all. Do you? I mean, he pops up later in the book of John just once. I mean, you want to hear it? Listen to this from John 21 verse 2. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. That's it. I know what you're thinking. At least now we know where he's from. <laughs> but this name, Nathaniel, doesn't show up any, anywhere else in any of the list of disciples in the other Gospels, nor in Acts, or the rest of the New Testament. But I did do some digging and found that most scholars believe Nathaniel to be just another name for the disciple call, called Bartholomew. This name translates Bar, son of, Tholomew, or Talme. Uh, they're likely the same person. And that, my friends, solves the problem. You're welcome. But it doesn't. <laughs> because Bartholomew is only found in four verses in all the Gospels. And in each verse, he's simply mentioned in a list with the others. So, <laughs> who was Nathaniel or Bartholomew? Who was he? What do we know? Does it matter? Maybe. I mean, we primarily just have some legendary material. One historian tells us that after the Great Commission, Nathaniel went straight to India, or he went to Armenia. Actually, no one is really certain where he went after Jesus. One legend tells us that he converted a king to Christianity, but due to the anger of some others, he was martyred soon after. I mean, his martyrdom is actually depicted in a wide range of art throughout the centuries, but I'm not really going to discuss it here because his is actually more gruesome than some of the others. I mean, you can see hints of this in the Sistine Chapel, where he is painted with memories of his martyrdom. The National Gallery of Art has a piece called The Martyrdom of Saint Bartholomew by the Italian painter Giuseppe de Ribera from the 1630s. It portrays the old apostle in ardent communication with his executioner, and what's more, the executioner seems to be transfixed by this man, his face suggesting a moment of doubt. 
but all of that is much later material. It seems the only thing we really know about this man, call him Bartholomew or Nathaniel, is that he was called by Jesus and he eventually gave it all for Jesus. We only know the beginning and the end and that's all. So let's look at the beginning one more time to see if there's anything we missed. I know I may be making something out of nothing, but I do think there might be something there. Now, a rereading of John 1, 35 through 51, the Andrew Chapel version. After Jesus calls John and Andrew to follow him, and after Andrew goes and gets his brother Simon Peter, and after Jesus meets Peter and renames him, and after Jesus finds Philip and calls him to follow as well, Philip finds Nathanael. And Philip tells him, Nathanael, we found the one that Moses and the prophets talked about, the one we've been waiting for. And it turns out the one we've been waiting for is Jesus, Joseph's son, from over in Nazareth. And Nathanael looks up at his friend Philip, and being one who always speaks his mind, says the first thing that comes to mind. Nazareth? <laughs> You've got to be kidding. Can anything good come out of that place? I mean, can something really come out of that tiny nothing of a town? And Philip looks at his friend and says, come and see. So. The two get up and start toward Jesus, but Jesus sees them coming and, and he says, Nathanael, now there is a real Israelite, not a false bone in his body, no deceit. What you see is what you get. Now, Nathanael is a little taken aback and, and he says, how do you know me? Where did you get that idea? And Jesus replies, a long time ago, before Philip brought you to me, I, I saw you underneath a fig tree. Now pause. I'm not really sure what this is supposed to mean. The fig tree bit. Some say it is a reference to an Old Testament scripture that mentions a fig tree. It could have to do something with the community that's reading this gospel. They might understand it or it may be just some insider information. Or it could be, and I, I tend to think, that Jesus may have been referencing something, some kind of memory or past experience that no one might have really known that no one had ever heard of, that only God and Nathaniel knew about. Maybe, maybe it was a painful memory, perhaps a decision that Nathaniel had made at one time, a right decision, but a hard decision, one that cost him something. Perhaps it stuck with him a long time, causing long days and longer nights, and maybe this hard thing occurred near a fig tree. Perhaps the fig tree was a a reference to a place he knew well, but one that carried deep pain and anguish that he never shared with anyone. And it was heavy, but he had to carry it alone. Some burden that was his alone. I don't know. But here comes Jesus who says, this is Nathaniel and he is genuine. He does not deceive. He is honest and true. Nathaniel replies, what do you mean? You don't even know me. But Jesus looks him in his eyes and sees into his heart and says, Nathaniel, a long time ago and under the fig tree, I saw you. And at once, the weight of the world releases from Nathaniel's shoulders. He takes a deep breath. He can't quite figure it out, but for some reason he feels heard and seen and understood for the first time in a long time. And he believes. <laughs> Teacher. Rabbi, you have seen me and now I see you. You are the king, you are the one, the Messiah. And Jesus looks back at him and says, you ain't seen nothing yet. Over the next few years, Nathaniel would witness lives changed, people healed, and a sacrifice greater than he could have imagined, with an ending far more beautiful than he could have dreamed. He would take Jesus at his word and go into the world bringing love and compassion and the language of Jesus and sacrifice and resurrection. And soon after, he would be put on trial, tortured, and killed. We don't know a lot about Nathaniel or Bartholomew or whatever you would like to call him. And maybe I'm writing words into the story that don't belong. Perhaps, perhaps I'm really making something out of nothing. But why not? After all, that is the plan of God, is it not? To take us in our sorrow and selfishness and self-righteousness and know-it-allness and our ignorance 
of the humanity around us and to make us new, to help us see our neighbors, to transform us, to give us new birth, to make something out of nothing. God did the same thing with the chaos and darkness in Genesis 1. God did the same thing with a frightened mother putting her child in a basket on the Nile. God did the same thing with a teenage shepherd and a few stones against a giant. God did the same thing with a bunch of fishermen. God did the same thing with a man named Nathaniel. And out of a tiny town called Nazareth, really? Can something really come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Northside Chapel is the funeral home just down the road. If you turn right out of the church, you will see it pretty soon. And all the funerals that occur there and all the loss and grief that takes place, there are so many flowers. Flowers are a huge part of the experience at every memorial service. I don't, I don't know what most funeral homes do with all those flowers. I know some of the families take them, but the families don't always take them home. I imagine some of them get thrown away. These flowers mean something for a moment and then they get tossed. Our friend Wayne works there and I don't know how it happened, but he started bringing these leftover flowers over. And Emily Johnson and some others started creating arrangements out of these flowers for other people. And so every week these flowers originally meant for moments of grief and loss, these flowers that had no more purpose and were going straight to the trash, they started being repurposed. And every week, with the help of many deliverers, these flowers started going to those in our community who have been going through a hard time, those who are grieving, those who are celebrating a new birth or marriage, or those who just need a pick-me-up, or someone who may have just visited for the first time, and we just wanted to say welcome. Emily and Wayne and so many others have gotten really good <laughs> at making something out of nothing. They have given us an image of exactly what it is that God does in you and in me. May you know that nothing is ever the end. In fact, nothing might just be the beginning of something. May you understand that God is at work in you now. May you let God continue that work so that you might be purposed for something great. And may you believe in the universal God's ability to take nothing and make it into something what God did in the beginning, what God did in a manger, what God did in Nathaniel, God is also doing.